And it's now my great pleasure to introduce the third speaker, Alexander Bouffetov from CNRS and Institut de Mathématiques de Marseille, Steklov Institute and IITP Russian Academy of Sciences, who will speak on determinante point processes, quasi symmetries, minimality, and interpolation. Azatlik Giu Elefteria Horea Libertas Freehet Volnest Svoboda Svobodu Azato Miftahov. So we start with the key point process of random matrix theory, uh, the sign process, uh, and uh, uh, just uh, this is the sign kernel that we have on the blackboard. The sign kernel, uh, we, uh, its appearance I will motivate uh, uh, in a moment, uh, corresponds to the projection on the Pelivinor space whose uh, uh, definition, uh, whose definition is recalled here. So the Pelivinor space of functions uh, whose Fourier transform has uh, support on the interval minus pi pi. And uh, so this is the orthogonal projection. And in fact, it will be important for the evolution of this talk uh, that just this operator is a spectral uh, projection. It's a spectral projection corresponding to the op uh, differential operator of taking the second derivative. Okay, so uh, let me formulate immediately the main result of the talk and then I will recall the necessary definitions. So the question, so the sign process is a measure on the space of configurations on the real line, that is to say on the space of infinite subsets of the real line without accumulation points. And so if we have such a subset, the question is what does the subset sampled with respect to the measure know about the underlying functional space, the Pelivinor space in this example. And this is the main result of the talk that in fact, the subset, the random subset, it's an infinite subset with one particle removed, with one particle removed is in fact a uniqueness set for the Pelivinor space. That is to say that any Pelivinor function if it is zero in restriction to the configuration minus one particle is in fact the identically zero function. Let us not forget that Pelivinor functions are entire functions and therefore uh, all this writing makes perfect sense. And as I hope to uh, convince you uh, uh, during the talk, the key step in the argument is in fact the quasi invariance of the sign process under a sufficiently large group of diffeomorphisms of the line. Uh, that is to say that a certain analog of the definite theorem is valid for the sign process. Okay, so let me just also introduce one of the main characters of the talk, uh, namely, so uh, let me formulate a certain converse to this result. Uh, that is that if two particles are removed from a realization of the sign process, uh, then uh, in fact, it is no longer a uniqueness set for the pale inner space. In fact, a very explicit function, a very explicit function can be written. Here it is uh, a very explicit infinite product convergent in principal value. Uh, it's a function in T and X are the particles of the configuration. This function, it's an entire function. It's in fact a Pelivinor function. And by its very definition, it is uh, zero at all the particles except two. In fact, uh, the, it, what, it, what one needs is to prove that it is indeed a Pelivinor function. So uh, the key property uh, on which all the analysis revolves is that the sign process has determinantal correlation functions determinantal correlation functions here they're written the correlation functions are the determinants of the sign kernel and in fact this very definition can be seen as stemming from the wild character formula and please allow me to explain this so i should say while i erase that in its most general form the study of point processes can be taken back 
to the work of John Grant in 1662. So he was studying uh, mortality in London. So how deaths of Londoners were distributed among the different neighborhoods of London. And so precisely the uh, occurrences of indistinguishable events uh, in this uh, specific case, uh, deaths of Londoners uh, occurring at random, at random positions, at random time and random positions in space is essentially the first example of a point process. So the theory received great impetus with the development of phone lines. In fact, one of the key protagonists of the general theory, uh, Conrad Palm was not a mathematician, but an engineer for Ericsson in Stockholm. And in fact, his work was mathematized by Alexander Hinchin in the Soviet Union. But so, uh, and next, of course, the theory received a great impetus in the work of the late uh, Sir Freeman Dyson, who, um, who started to study matrices whose entries are given by chance. And in fact, this concept of a matrix whose entries are given by chance has proved extremely fruitful both for the theory and in applications. In fact, all predictions of random matrix theory have received very substantial experimental verification. So following Dyson, let us consider the unitary group UN. And to a matrix in the unitary group, let's assign its spectrum, spectrum of U. So the spectrum is, let us consider it as a configuration on the torus. So in fact, it is not really, it is not really a point on the torus, it is a point on the quotient of the torus under the action of the symmetric group. We neglect uh, um, matrices with uh, degenerate eigenvalues and uh, just this, the measure on this space, I point out that of course the difference between the torus and the quotient is not observable on the finite level, but on the infinite level, it becomes quite important. Uh, configurations are unordered subsets. So uh, the, spec the measure on the spectrum precisely by the vile character formula, the vile character formula is just the product like this. And one observes without difficulty that this product can be reformulated, can be rewritten in determinantal form where dn is the Dirichlet kernel. So uh, the Dirichlet kernel And uh, just uh, extremely important that this determinantal form is preserved by taking projections, by taking projections. That is to say the projection of this measure on the subset with fewer variables. So we just forget about one of the eigenvalues. It is strictly speaking, not a map, but a multi-map, but let's skip these details, uh, just the projection projection of this measure on the first K on the first L coordinates onto first L coordinates, uh, let's say R coordinates, again have this very same determinantal form, which is a lovely exercise if you have to give an exam in linear algebra for your students. So just uh, it is called the Ginebra meta theorem. Ginebra meta theorem. So precisely this determinantal form of the projections. Uh, so here I have KL from one to N and here I will have KL from one to R. So this determinantal form of the correlation functions allows one to undertake the scaling limit. So Dyson places himself on the unit circle and he observes the eigenvalues around him. So obviously we are on the unit circle and matrix has size n. So the, different, the distance between neighboring and eigenvalues is one over n. So he scales by a factor of n. 
And well, if one does the obvious change of variable, one notes that the sign here disappears and one gets, so under scaling limit, scaling limit, one gets precisely the sign kernel. The sign kernel. And furthermore, the determinantal property for the correlation function, so the number of particles grows, but the correlation functions, the correlation function being the infinitesimal probability of finding a path, let's say the third correlation function is the infinitesimal probability of finding a particle in each of these intervals. And of course, it doesn't matter how many more particles there are. So there may be a million or a billion particles, but we are just interested in, the, in whether each of these three infinitesimal intervals contains a particle. And at this point, it's a determinant three times three, whether we have a million, a billion, or infinitely many particles. And this precise remark allows one to take the scaling limit and to consider the sign process on the space of infinite configurations. Well, obviously under scaling, the circle becomes the line. So we have, uh, we have a, uh, what was written before, we have a measure on the space of infinite subsets of the line without accumulation points or configurations on the line. And uh, the correlation functions are given by the determinantal formula, which was already here before, because precisely they admit the scaling limit. And the key point here is this determinantal property. And in fact, the idea of studying, of axiomatizing on this determinantal property is due to the French physicist Odile Maquis. She wrote this very beautiful paper in 1973, in 1973, she used the terminology fermionic processes because it was supposed to model fermions, but this uh, terminology uh, gradually stopped being used. So, and then uh, really it turned out that this axiomatization on the determinantal property, so consider a point processes following John Grant, consider a point process that is to say, a measure on the space of subsets, in this case of the line, uh, consider a, a point process whose correlation functions are given by determinants. This has turned, uh, this has turned out to be a very good uh, level of uh, abstraction, a very good level of generality in the sense that on the one hand, it encompasses very many examples of completely different nature, spanning trees, zeros of random analytic functions that I will uh, formulate more precisely in a moment, uh, obviously random matrices, uh, uh, and many, many, many more. So uh, representations, uh, decomposing measures for representations of infinite dimensional groups in the work of Boradina Dalshansky, and many, many, many more. So. Uh, the random permutations in the work of Johansson and Baik Dave Johansson and also Bradian Konkov and Dalshansky. So many, many examples on the one hand. And on the other hand, it is possible to construct in this case a general theory which is sufficiently rich and contains a sufficient number of general results precisely in this generality. For example, palm measures by the Shirai Takahashi theorem, the palm measures of determinant process are determinantal. So, uh, and uh, uh, there is a central limit theorem of Soshnikov in great generality for determinantal point processes. There is a large, this balance between examples and a general theory. Let me just formulate one more example, which we will briefly touch upon in this talk. So let us consider the unit disk and let us consider, so this is the Perez-Virac theorem. Perez -Virac theorem. So, so let us consider the unit disk and let us consider a random power series, a n, z, n, where a n are independent standard complex Gaussians. So the, the a n's are random variables. Let me to stress independence on the random parameter. Let me write a n of omega, omega being the randomness. These are independent complex Gaussians. I consider this power series and I consider it zero set. It is immediate from your favorite criterion for the radius of convergence, that the radius of convergence of this power series is equal to one. And in fact, we assign to this power series, it's zero set. So the zero set 
is a configuration. So it obviously, it's obviously infinite and it does accumulate, but it only accumulates on the boundary of the unit disk. So, and in fact, very remarkably, very remarkably, uh, this point process is a determinantal point process corresponding to the kernel KZW, which is one over pi one minus ZW bar square, which is nothing else but the Bergman kernel, the kernel introduced by Stefan Bergman uh, of uh, projection onto the space of functions K from L2 on the disk onto the space of holomorphic functions on the disk. Holomorphic L2, let me write like this. So it is in fact holomorphic L2, it is, which is in fact the Bergman space, holomorphic L2. So the, on the Bergman space, this is the operator of orthogonal projection on the Bergman space. There are many proofs of this very beautiful theorem. There is a very beautiful proof due to Manjunath Krishnapur, where he identifies these particles with eigenvalues of a corner of a random unitary matrix. So in fact, random matrices do make an appearance in this theorem too. So let me point out that from this theorem, so we can view uh, just the unit disk as the point a disk, the model for the Lobachevsky plane. And in fact, the distribution of the zeros is invariant under Lobachevsky anisometries, which is completely not obvious because the distribution of the function is not. So uh, the distribution of the zeros is invariant under the Lobachevsky anisometries. And it is in fact, uh, it helps analysis a lot. These symmetries of infinite, uh, these infinite dimensional measures, their symmetries help the analysis a lot. And in fact, there are quasi symmetries, which I mentioned earlier also. So let us start now with the question. So in, for the purposes of this talk, uh, I will only consider determinant point processes of which the kernel, the function of two variables induces an orthogonal projection. So in fact, it remains an open question. It remains an open question when, when does a kernel induce a determinant point processes? But there is a very convenient sufficient condition by Maki Soshnikov and also by Shirai Takahashi, also by Shirai Takahashi. So which says that if the kernel, uh, if the, two the function of two variables is a kernel of a projection, a kernel of a projection satisfying some assumptions, locally finite trace, Let's just, in, our, in all our examples, it will be, the kernels will be continuous and more. So if the kernel is an orthogonal projection, then the process exists. So this is not, this is not necessary. There are examples of determinant process which do not satisfy the Makisoshnikov theorem, but this is the only general result, at least that I know. So, and now the question can be formulated in more general terms. And in fact, this question was formulated by Lyons and Perez and Lyons worked on it. And there is also Gosh settled this question for the sign process itself. Uh, the question can be raised. The question can be raised. What does the realization of the point process know about the kernel? So in this case, it is S, in this case, it is K, uh, the Bergman kernel. What does the realization of the point process know about the kernel? Let me formulate this question in different terms, availing myself of this specific example. In fact, one easily verifies that this series is not square integrable. This series is not square integrable. One computes, one gets the harmonic series. So does there exist? But on the other hand, a zero set does not uniquely define a function which is zero on this set, one can play with the Weierstrass pr product, add exponential factors, there is a certain amount of liberty. So this series is divergence, one gets the harmonic series uh, if one applies the Kolmogorov to series theorem, but maybe there does exist a square integrable, square integrable function which is zero at all these points. Well, in fact, no. And uh, this is our result in joint work with uh, uh, Xu and Shamov. Hu and Shamov. So just in fact, we prove it in complete generality, but the Bergman case is the first case in which is the, how to say, the first example in which it was not known because 
in many, so in joint work with Xu and Shamov. So realization of realization of a determinantal point process is a uniqueness set of a determinantal point process is a uniqueness set is a uniqueness set for the underlying space the underlying function space. So for example, for the uh, Gaussian zero set, it's the Bergman space. And for the sine process, it's the Pelle-Wiener space. And there are also many other examples for the Ginebra process, it's the Fox space and so forth. So it's a uniqueness set. And as I mentioned uh, earlier work on this, uh, this statement uh, is a conjecture by Lyons and Paris. And there has been very important earlier work by Lyons and by Gosch so, and uh, uh, Lyons proved this in the discrete setting for processes which are, which have a discrete uh, countable phase space. And in fact, we started from the work of Lyons uh, and just the key point for us was in fact uh, that the conditional kernel, so the key point for us, I mentioned already is that palm measures of determinant point processes are themselves determinantal. And in fact, we proved this is the main lemma for us that conditional measures of determinant point processes are themselves determinantal. Conditional measures of determinant point processes are themselves determinantal. It's the key lemma in the paper. And in fact, the key step is the martingale property for this conditional kernel. The martingale property for this conditional kernel, which is the key technical step in this and here, please allow me to pursue a little digression. So uh, the martingale, martingales taking values in function spaces is a very well studied, in depth studied topic. So, but in fact, uh, I needed what seemed a very simple statement, which however, I couldn't prove. Uh, and that was uh, uh, the Hölder property for martingales taking values in Hölder function. So, and in fact, I wrote to Azat Niftakov asking this question and surely soon enough, I received the answer where he had a full solution written in his beautiful handwriting, which you saw on the board and just somehow then, well, obviously one just needed to uh, put that, to type that and put that on the archive. Please allow me also to say that the key difficulty in corresponding about mathematics with Azat Miftahov was in fact the censorship. So uh, it is, uh, the system of correspondence between a prisoner in a Russian gale and uh, somebody outside works really very well. So there is a system, one sends a letter, uh, one pays a very moderate fee uh, and it is delivered very quickly. And uh, then uh, the uh, prisoner sends a handwritten response, uh, the one you saw on the board. And uh, well, then one continues. The difficulty, however, is that the system, the correspondence system is also subject to law, specifically subject to censorship. And since the censor cannot be expected to speak foreign languages, foreign languages are expressly forbidden and that includes mathematical formulas. So in fact, in the very first letter, which Azat Miftakov sent me, there was what I assume was the Vandermond determinant, but I will never know because it was duly erased by the censor. So at this point, so and this was uh, so now I understand very well the convenience of symbolic notation in mathematics because I had to do without. So for example, when I had to write the Brownian bridge, I had to write so consider the Brownian motion. So in words, I'm quoting my letter quite literally. Consider the Brownian motion, where of the time is a fraction, where in the numerator I have one minus and so on and so on. So this is a literal quote from my letter. So this is why, in fact, just yesterday I received a letter from Azat Miftahov about mathematics. We do hope that this will lead to something, but uh, so please uh, keep your eye on the archive. Uh, it is yet too early for me to uh, report on it right now. Okay, so uh, uh, now we resume. So uh, the uniqueness, uh, the uniqueness property the uniqueness property is a completely general property for determinantal point processes. A completely general property for determinantal point processes. 
at the let us now go back to the sign process where the uniqueness itself was established by Gosch, as I mentioned. So for the sign process, we can consider the classical Kotelnikov theorem of 1933, Kotelnikov theorem. which says that a paley wiener function a paley wiener function can be represented as a series of shifts of the cardinal sign so in fact z is a uniqueness set for the paley wiener space and the function admi admits this representation in terms of F of f of t, let me write t actually. T minus k, t minus k, f of t. So the series converge in every conceivable sense. Uh, it and in fact it's an orthogonal representation of the square integrable function. And under additional smoothness assumptions on this uh, function, it also converges, it also converges. Pointwise, pointwise, and in uh, smooth categories, if f is itself assumed to be sufficiently smooth, as one can see from the formula itself, and it also is an orthogonal representation. It also is an orthogonal representation. So we can't hope for anything like this. We can't hope for anything like this in the setting of the sign process. So we cannot hope. So there exists a a uh, notion studied in depth uh, by Christian Seip, uh, whom Professor Vesovska mentioned also, uh, uh, just a uh, notion of sampling sets, of sampling sets uh, <clears throat> uh, where these are sets. Let us, let us for the time being stick to the Pelevinar space. So these are sets such that the restriction of the function on the set, so this becomes a function from small L2, the restriction of the function on the set, the L2 norm is comparable to the L2 norm of the initial Pelevinar function. So, but uh, realizations of the sign process can never possibly be sampling because in fact, they are not separated. So let us recall that the, mm, that the uh, uh, realization, <clears throat> the trajectory of the sign process emerged from the eigenvalues of a random unitary matrix. But of course, the, it, there exists a positive probability that there are some eigenvalues very close to each other. And of course, any almost every realization of the sign process is in fact not a separated set. The distance between uh, particles can be arbitrarily small. It's not bounded away from zero. So also it's not bounded away from infinity, the distance between consecutive particles. Uh, so there also exists arbitrarily large gaps in the realization of the sign process, but this is not very important for us. So uh, just we have this, uh, having such a representation is completely impossible. Having such a representation is completely impossible. Uh, just it is not possible to expect uh, a, an orthogonal series. It's not possible to expect, so here it is indeed an isomorphism. The Katelnikov theorem uh, provides an isomorphism, a Hilbert space isomorphism between isomet isometrical isomorphism between Pelevinar space and small L2. Such a thing is impossible in our setting. There is also another point which one has to appreciate. So as I mentioned, our general theorem also applies to the Bergman point process. At the same time, it one easily imagines that in the Bergman space, in the Bergman space, multiplying the function by Blaschke product or dividing function by Blaschke product doesn't have an impact on the function being or not a Bergman function. So while the set is a uniqueness set, while the realization of, of a set is a uniqueness set, it is always possible to remove, so if one removes 55 particles, it's still a uniqueness set. In fact, it's always possible to remove infinitely many particles, maybe, uh, maybe uh, sufficiently sparse, so that it still remains being a uniqueness set. 
So it is a, it is not possible. So here again, here the set Z is a uniqueness set for the Paley inner space, but it is also a minimal set with this property. It's a minimal set with this property. It's a minimal set with this property. And such a thing is simply not possible, simply not possible for the, <clears throat> for the Bergman space. So it is not always, so one says that a uniqueness set, so a set, a set is a uniqueness set for a function space. If, if a function from the space restricted to the set is zero exclusively when it is the zero function. So for example, uh, realization of a determinant point process is a uniqueness set for the underlying function space. So for sign process by theorem of Gauche, uh, for Bergman, uh, for Bergman process by our result. At the same time, at the same time, uh, it is not possible, it is not possible uh, in the Bergman space for uniqueness set to be a minimal set. A minimal set is a set which is a uniqueness set and it is the smallest set having such property. It is a uniqueness set and it is the smallest set having such property. So it is, such situation is not possible for Bergman space. It is, however, possible for the sign process. And this is the main result with which I started the talk. So for the sign process, the uh, trajectory, the realization of the sign process is the uniqueness set. If one particle is removed, it is a uniqueness and minimal set. So if two particles are removed, there is an explicit function, explicit Pelevinar non-zero Pelevinar function. So let me also very briefly comment on the problem of interpolation. So we do have in joint work with Borichev and Klimenko, we do have uh, a partial result in the direction of the uh, Kotelnikov theorem. So we do have, so if F decays sufficiently polynomially fast, decays sufficiently polynomially fast, F in Pele Wiener space, uh, decay sufficiently polynomially fast at infinity, at infinity, then in fact, the Lagrange interpolation formula interpolates F. Lagrange interpolation recovers F. Interpolation recovers F. Recovers F. So uh, just uh, uh, the how to say, uh, the, mm, there is a gap because, uh, because we don't know what happens if the function does not decay sufficiently fast. And from the technical standpoint, the key difficulty, the key difficulty is that in the Lagrange interpolation formula, there are derivatives and it's precisely the derivatives estimating the derivative from below, which is the key difficulty in the paper. Okay, so let me now, uh, very briefly mention that in the context of the Bergman space, in the context of the Bergman space, there is joint work with Xu, where in fact we recover joint work with Xu, where we recover uh, recover the a Bergman function. We recover a Bergman function from its restriction on the zero set of the Gaussian analytical function. So on realization of the a uh, determinantal point process with the uh, Bergman kernel, we recover using the Patterson-Sullivan construction. So using the Patterson-Sullivan construction, again here, uh, so we let D be the Poincaré, Poincaré metric. So Poincaré metric, it is here again that the Lobachevskian geometry plays the key role. So we consider a X distance between x and z naught, we consider f of x. We divide, so this is summation over all x in the configuration, but in fact, summation has to be taken over annuli, over annuli. So then we can, we normalize, obviously. We take limit as s goes to one. And we recover f of z naught. Also, this recovery can be made uniform in sufficiently small subspace of the Bergman space. 
in subspace such that the reproducing kernel has at most logarithmically growing coefficients. So this is reconstruction for the, this is reconstruction for the Bergman space. Okay, in the remaining time, uh, I will want to say a few words about the argument and I want to introduce, reintroduce the main character, which is in fact the analog of the characteristic polynomial of the characteristic polynomial of my random matrix, except I don't have a random matrix anymore. I have an infinite configuration and I will now consider the analog of its characteristic polynomial. We go back to the sign process and in fact, we will now remain exclusively with the sign process until the end of the talk and I will also explain why. So, uh, okay, so to a realization of the sign process, one assigns the following entire function. As I wrote, So the product is understood in principal value. That is to say over symmetric growing intervals, one minus T over X. So this is similar to the Euler product formula for the sine function. But we will see that the function will also be different. So, and in fact, the result that I have formulated, the main result of the talk is that in fact, for any P in X, gx over t minus p does not belong to the Paley-Wiener space, whereas uh, gx over t minus p t minus q, so for any p q, p not equal to q, t minus p t minus q does belong to the Paley-Wiener space. So I should say that uh, that the division the, the division, the Paley-Wiener space has the division property, has the division property. If a, uh, just like polynomials. So if one divides a polynomial by, if a polynomial has a root at some point and one divides by the root, uh, by T minus the root, then one still gets a polynomial. The same is true for Paley-Wiener functions. And in fact, uh, this is, characterization of projection kernel in joint work with uh, Roman Romanov. This is characterization of projective kernels having so-called integrable form. So having form of this type. So like uh, the kernels in the branch theory, except uh, this class of examples is somewhat more general. The Paley-Wiener space is a de branch space, but the class of integrable kernels includes also examples which are not the branch. So uh, the, it's in fact a characterization as we proved with Romanov. The fact that, the, that there is a division property, please observe the division property as I formulated is somewhat weaker than the branch axiom, but in fact, also the class one gets is larger. It's a characterization. And also in joint work in progress with Pierre Lazag, we are able to uh, characterize uh, this property in terms of uh, Giambelli, uh, Giambelli, compatibility, uh, Giambelli compatibility of uh, uh, Baradin, Strachov, and Alshansky. So, uh, in fact, uh, Jambelli compatibility holds for an analog of Jambelli compatibility holds for processes of this form. Okay, so uh, let me now say that the key point in the analysis of in the analysis of this function. So, in the proof of these two statements. So, as I have explained, I don't need to prove that it is not in Pelevina, I only need to prove that it is not in L2. And here I only need to prove that it is in L2 because if it is in L2, it is automatically in the Pelevina space because of divisibility. Okay, and so how do I prove that it is not in L2? So, and in fact, here I'm able to take advantage of the beautiful work related to the fyodorov hyari keating conjecture. fyodorov hyari keating conjecture. Um, uh, so, in fact, uh, I am able to apply in this formalism. So, this function can be seen 
this function can be seen as the analog, as the counterpart in my setting of the characteristic polynomial of the random matrix. And in fact, I am able to apply in this setting the analysis of Argan, uh, Bellos, and Bourgard. So for the characteristic polynomial of a random matrix, who in turn uh, rely on the analysis of Nicola Kistler of uh, random uh, hierarchical, of Derrida hierarchical models. So how does this, how does this, uh, function, this random entire function, look like. In fact, uh, in fact, uh, Kistler provides, and uh, Argan Belis Burgard used this analysis for, uh, for <clears throat> the uh, random, for the, excuse me, for the characteristic polynomial of a random matrix, and it, I, I apply it in this setting. Uh, the, one can use a very, simple and clear analogy, which can be made quite precise. Namely, let us consider a binary tree. Let us consider a binary tree. Let us consider a binary tree. So, and in each vertex of the binary tree, so it's just, a, let us consider just a finite binary tree. In each vertex of the finite binary tree, we place a standard Gaussian random variable. In each vertex of the, in each vertex of the finery, we place a standard Gaussian random variable following Kistler. So now we consider sums along paths. We consider sums along paths. And let us say we're interested in the maximal. Let's say we're interested in the maximal of these quantities. So a very naive bound, very naive bound gives the answer. So uh, if, so uh, square root two, square root two n, the probability that the maximum is bigger where n is the depth of the tree. The probability that the maximum is bigger than that is exponentially small. So, uh, locked, excuse me, locked. Yes, so just the, uh, question is how to get an inverse bound. Question is how to get an inverse bound. So uh, the inverse bound, <clears throat> the inverse bound would be immediate from the borel cantelli lemma if, in fact, these were just independent random variables, but they are not. But they are not. So uh, how does one obtain the inverse bound? And in fact, precisely, Kistler provides a completely elementary formalism. Uh, so obviously uh, the sums into paths are not independent because the paths have a common, a common interval, a common interval. Uh, paths have a common interval. At the same time, the common interval is very small. So clearly paths diverge very quickly and starting from that point, they're independent. So, and precisely Kistler develops an analysis uh, which uh, takes care of this non-independence and allows one to use, one uses not the borel cantelli lemma, but in fact, the Paley, uh, the Paley Zygmunt inequality. Use the Paley Zygmunt inequality. So in fact, it turns out that this very simple picture is exactly what happens for the characteristic polynomial or for this function, for this Jx, for this Jx. So just in fact, what are the independent segments? One needs to consider, well, here we have a multiplicative functional. One needs to consider the additive functional. So one needs to consider the additive functional. It is also convenient to normalize it. It is also convenient to normalize it to put I epsilon here. Consider this additive functional. It satisfies the central limit theorem. In fact, uh, it is a corollary of the second theorem of Segur. But what is important for me is the independence of this quantity for different values of t. And in fact, there is no independence. And in this, I follow uh, the analysis of Argan, Bellis, and Bourgard. But there is a hierarchical independence, a hierarchical independence. And the hierarchical independence 
Namely, so as opposed to Argan Bellius Borgat, the frequencies that are important for me are the low frequencies. So the low frequencies, the lower the frequency, the longer it takes for them to become independent. The lower the frequency, the greater. So if the frequency is not very low, then for not sufficiently different values of t, they are already independent. If the frequency is low enough, then one needs to take a sufficiently big difference in t's for those frequencies to become independent. And this is what allows the analysis to go through. And then again, so I'm proving that this quantity is not, so let me argue in a very naive way. I'm proving that this quantity is not square integrable. In fact, I know that its values at any t, well, with some normalization, but it doesn't change things very much, is exponential of a Gaussian, exponential of a Gaussian random variable. I can estimate the tails. I can estimate the big tails. So again, uh, what matters for me is the big tail. So uh, the Gaussian random variable lives around its standard deviation, the square root of its variance. What matters for me is in this analysis, uh, as it matters, for example, in uh, uh, the study of Gaussian multiplicative chaos, is when the random variable is of the order of the size of its variance, which is here logarithm of t. So these events are, these are, let us say, large deviations. These events are not very probable. But the series of these events does diverge. So I would like to use the inverse borel cantelli lemma, except I can't because these events are not independent. So precisely, I need to use this hierarchical independence of uh, Kistler and Argan Belles Bourgade in order to say that not only, not only for, for some t, uh, the random variable becomes big, but also this event occurs infinitely many times. And so the function is not square integrable. The function is not square integrable. Okay, so in the five minutes that remain to me, uh, let me just very briefly say, uh, make two very brief remarks that uh, the possibility to apply this analysis uh, uh, relies on the need to take the scaling limit of the Seagull theorem, of the second Seagull theorem, scaling limit of the second Seagull theorem, except, so I need a scaling limit of the second Seagull theorem. So the second Seagull theorem gives an asymptotic formula of, this, of strong Seagull. Uh, the strong Seagull theorem gives an asymptotic formula uh, for a topless determinant, that is to say, multiplicative functional of unitary matrix. And I need a scaling limit. I need a scaling limit. So I need a multiplicative functional of the sign process. And in fact, it's not possible to take literally scaling limit in strong Seagull. So I need to take scaling limit in strong, of strong Seagull in the form of boradina kunkov Geronimo case. So uh, this is possible. Uh, so this is possible. This statement admits a transition to the scaling limit. And this is exactly uh, what I do. Uh, so and now uh, the second and main point is that what underlies this analysis, what is the main technical difficulty of this analysis, that at some point, uh, I need an estimate on high frequencies of these additive statistics. This is, by the way, a difficulty which also Johansson, uh, Johansson uh, has in his uh, classical work on the convergence to normal distributions for additive statistics of classical groups. And Johansson has exactly this difficulty. He needs to estimate high frequencies of the, well, what for him is characteristic polynomial, what for me is this. So, and I am able to follow Johansson analysis. What does Johansson do? Johansson does a change of variable. It is very difficult to estimate a rapidly oscillating integral. It is somewhat easier to estimate an exponentially decaying integral. So Johansson makes a change of variable, which makes a function lying on the unit circle, he uh, deforms the contour and, and uh, uh, the function becomes, uh, the function becomes <clears throat> uh, a uh, exponentially decaying function. And then he's able to apply Seagull's theorem to exponentially decaying function and just even one applies the weak Seagull theorem, the first Seagull theorem, the one that Seagull proved when he was 19 years old in the trenches of the First World War. So one applies that and one gets, one gets the uh, 
decay of uh, decay, desired decay of Fourier coefficients. So in this setup, precisely uh, uh, the main step, uh, uh, the main step is precisely uh, in doing in making this change of variable is precisely that the sign process, uh, the sign process is quasi invariant. So in order to do a change of variable, one needs to make sure that the Jacobian at least exists. So precisely the key technical step is that the sign process is quasi invariant. So under diffeomorphisms, so there are two, uh, first of all, under diffeomorphisms with compact support, with compact support, but in fact more, but in fact under diffeomorphisms x goes to x plus phi of x, where phi has finite one half Sobolev norm, seminorm and finite first Sobolev seminorm. These conditions, since these are seminorms and not norms, these conditions do not apply one another. Oh. So since uh, the sign process is quasi invariant uh, with Radonica dim derivatives that can be written down explicitly, under these diffeomorphisms, it is possible to uh, use the change of variable method of Johansson. Uh, and then it is possible to estimate the Fourier transform of this analog of the characteristic polynomial. And then using the scaling limit of the boradino konikov geronimo case formula, it is possible to reduce to the scheme of Kistler and argambelius burgard and to prove that uh, the sign process without one particle, uh, the realization of sign process without one particle is a uniqueness set for the paleo inner space and with two particles is not. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Sasha, for this very interesting lecture. So uh, many of us want again to ask questions or maybe make comments, but uh, due to lack of time. But people can write, time, people can write to me. People can yes, write to me, I will answer all the questions. And we will, Please yeah, write. We will, we will forward the, the questions. So I should say that we are delighted to know that uh, Azad continues to do mathematics in prison despite the difficult situation. <laughs>